Hello and a very warm welcome to a brand new edition of World Panorama with me, Frank Pereira, right here on Rajya Sabha Television. Over the next half hour, we'll take you through all the significant uh, developments to have taken place around the world this week. But first up, as always, a look at the headlines. Grizzly video showing uh, the burning alive of a hostage Jordanian pilot released on social media. Footage leads to outrage against the Islamic State in Jordan. The government promises swift revenge, executes two prisoners on death row. U.S. President Barack Obama's $4 trillion budget wish list dismissed by Republican-dominated Congress. Analysts call it a pre-election manifesto. Republicans likely to come out with counter-proposals soon. Trans-Asia plane crashes into river in Taiwan shortly after takeoff. 35 of the 58 on board killed in the crash. Eight people still missing, others including a toddler rescued. Pulitzer Prize-winning author Harper Lee will publish her second novel more than 50 years after the release of her classic To Kill a Mockingbird, sequel to be published by Harper Publishers on July 14th. Well, Islamic State militants released another grisly execution video late on Tuesday appearing to show a captured Jordanian pilot being burnt alive. The killing is seen as a retaliation to Jordan's support to the US in airstrikes in Syria. Amid uproar and anger, Jordan hit back quickly, executing two Iraqi militants in response. Not just uh, that, Jordan's monarch, King Abdullah himself, led an airstrike against the militants. Here's a report. A man resembling Jordanian pilot Maud Al Kasabi stands in a black cage before being set ablaze. He wears orange clothes similar to those worn by other foreign Islamic State captives who have been shown in brutal videos over the last few months. Incidentally, the video appeared at a time when Jordan's King Abdullah met U.S. lawmakers for a deal against the terror group. Jordan prepared for a strong response after protests erupted over the killing. And the reply was prompt and tough. Two Al-Qaeda captives, one of them a female suicide bomber, were executed by hanging. Islamic State has demanded release of the female bomber to free the Jordanian pilot. UN joined in global condemnation of the latest gruesome act by the Islamic State group. Condemns the killing of Jordanian Royal Air Force pilot Moaz al Kasabe by Daesh, a terrorist organization with no regard for human life. The pilot was captured after crashing during an anti IS mission over Syria in December. This is the third killing by Islamic State within weeks of the beheading of two Japanese hostages. Special prayers were held in Jordan to mourn the death of the pilot. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Joining me for a chat today to talk about the Islamic State crisis in West Asia is uh, Mr. Pinak Ranjan Chakravarti, former Secretary, Ministry of External Affairs. Uh, Ambassador Chakravarti, thank you for joining me on the program and welcome. You know, the rise of Islamic State in uh, West Asia has been problematic for all the countries in the region and not just that, even several other countries uh, like France and, uh, and Japan also, as well as the United States, are bearing the brunt of what's happening there. You know, what's the problem really as far as West Asia is concerned? Are we going to see any kind of a solution anytime soon? Well, I don't see a solution in the immediate future. And let us not forget that the IAS is a creation of some of these countries. And, you know, for the political jockeying and geopolitical uh, considerations, Turkey, Saudi Arabia and others who first actually helped and along with the Western countries, to create this rebel opposition to Bashar al-Assad, the president of mm. Syria, which finally has led to the creation of uh, IS. Because the IS is now the predominant group which has taken over the remnants of the Al-Qaeda and other rebels, etc. Then they suddenly coined the phrase called moderate rebels because mm. the whole agenda was regime change in Syria. And the, the role of Israel is also there in terms of upsetting the apple cart in Syria. But now they have created a monster. It is not unlike what happened in Afghanistan. When to push out the Soviets, the Americans, the Saudis, in fact, the present King Salman, the new king, was the main coordinator, if you go back in history. 
and he was the main coordinator of funneling money to create the Mujahideen and then the Taliban. When, when the Soviets slept, what happened? The Taliban turned on these guys only. Mm. Mm. Osama bin Laden was their creation as well. So I think IS is, is not dissimilar to those things. You begin with a, with a regime change project, which finally spins out of control. And all the arms and, and the lethal weaponry that you have provided lands up in the, uh, in the extremists. Now, what is the problem the Europeans and the West are facing? They have sizable Muslim communities who are disgruntled, who and fringe elements of that uh, are joining up uh, and far as far as, you know, even India one or two or some people tried to join. Indonesia, you have it. Japan, you mentioned. So it's, it's like a magnet sucking in some of these uh, disgruntled, you know, uh, who have nothing else to do and who are brainwashed uh, about, uh, you know, about their beliefs, etc., who are trying to join these people, thinking that a new caliphate, which is always a dream of the Sunni Muslims. Is it only a religious uh, issue or is it also because of socio-economic problems that people, disgruntled youth, actually are going and joining the Islamic State? It's not purely a religious issue. Religion is, is only a tool or a vehicle. They are calling themselves an Islamic state. They are invoking the golden period of Islam by saying that we found a new caliphate. They are not going to succeed ultimately because mm. I don't think this modern world can accommodate a caliphate in this day and age. In any case, the caliphate is a Sunni concept and the Shias have no part in it and the Shias are well, a certain sizable section of the Muslim community, apart from the other sects and all that populate the Middle East. Take Syria, for example. You have the Alawites, you have the Druzes, you have the Yazidis, you have all kinds of sects and all. So I don't think this is a, I mean, IS. But the problem is that the U.S. cannot go and solve it for, for the rest of the mm -hmm. countries, which is what somehow they have come to accept, because the U.S. has been the major security provider to the Middle East. So today, I think Saudi Arabia, which funded them now, is mortally afraid that the IS is going to come and uh, come and inflict some pain on them as well. So is Syria. So is uh, Turkey, for example, worried very much because the Kurds, which are actually who are actually fighting the IS, don't I mean don't get along with the, the with the Turks. The Turks have a have a Kurdish problem. So now it's a, become such a complex issue that wh who is supporting whom and how will they actually deal with it. It will take some time to pan out and uh, IS is developing a certain administrative structure. They are getting in, uh, they are developing revenue streams to fund their kind of existence, so to speak. And Iraq is virtually divided, so is Syria. So uh, it's going to be a long haul. It I is think uh, it's a long haul. And, and you know, what's uh, alarming is the fact that we are going to continue to see some of these executions, videos being released by the Islamic State. You know, these videos that they are releasing on the internet seem to be getting more and more gruesome by the day and that's an alarming fact, isn't it? And also of late we've seen uh, ransom demands being made by the Islamic State. It is, is it a sign of the Islamic State's uh, funds also dwindling a bit? The, it, it could be, but uh, raising money is always an option through these kind of uh, means, asking for ransom. And the whole purpose of this public beheadings and this gruesome burning of the Jordanian uh, sort of pilot is, I suppose, publicity, telling the whole world because it, it goes viral on the internet and everybody sees it. Some other, uh, you know, these kind of uh, fringe elements somewhere else in the world uh, think that, oh, this is, uh, this is something that, uh, that I should be a part of. I mean, they must be mad to think like that, but there are some, we have mad people on this planet. Mm, mm. And um, so the IS really is uh, pandering to that kind of a thing. But, um, but let's not get focused too much on religion here. I don't think this is a religious fight because uh, if it were a religious fight, then the sectarian, sectarian issue, etc., would not be there. I mean, the Shias are killing Sunnis, the Sunnis are killing Shias. And it's going on, and they are killing the Yazidis, which are another. You know, it's a Christian sect, actually. Yes. And uh, so there are there are lots of these. I mean, after all, Middle East has been the the cradle of uh, you know Christianity. You know, the the earliest Christian communities uh, were in the Middle East and not anywhere else. Yes. And uh, so is Judaism, and so is Islam. So I don't know. I mean, I think this is a this is a fight that the modern world does not need and we have to move on. But then at the end of the day, one has to reflect and realize 
what kind of a state Saudi Arabia is. Mm. Mm. And I think if you trace many of these things, it goes back to them. And the kind of state they run, the kind of laws uh, they use. Saudi Arabia has beheaded about 2,000 people in the last uh, 10 years publicly. They still practice that. And the IS is doing the same thing. What's the difference? Okay. Um, All right. Uh, Ambassador Chakravarti will have to leave to that. Thank you so much for joining us on the program uh, today and sharing your views on this very crucial subject. Well, on that note, of course, we'll move on. Yemen's uh, Shia Houthi rebels have uh, announced a new presidential council in a move that could signal their formal takeover of the country's government. The United Nations said that it would not acknowledge the announcement made on Friday afternoon. The world body termed the announcement a unilateral decision. The rebels had earlier seized the presidential palace and key government buildings on January 22nd. The takeover prompted President Abd Rabu Mansour Hadi and his uh, Prime Minister to tender their resignations. Hadi and his cabinet are being held under house arrest by the rebels. Moving on now, the Transasia plane that crashed in Taiwan on Wednesday had lost power in both engines. The black box data of the flight revealed what went wrong with the aircraft moments before the crash. However, authorities say that it was too early to draw firm conclusions about the reasons why the engines malfunctioned. Meanwhile, four more bodies were recovered from the crash site on Friday morning, taking the death toll to 35. Here's a detailed report. Both the engines of the Transasia Airlines plane that crashed in Taiwan had failed. This has been revealed by the data of the plane's black box. Taiwan's Aviation Safety Council has said that the engines failed to produce enough thrust for two minutes after takeoff. Meanwhile, the search and rescue teams retrieved four more bodies from the crash site on Friday. Taiwanese Vice President paid his respects to the victims at a funeral in Taipei. He also praised the pilot who tried his best to steer the plane away from nearby residences before crashing into the river. Transasia Airways announced $38,000 as compensation to the families of the victims. Investigators are to issue a preliminary report on the crash within 30 days and a fuller report within three to four months. A final draft will be submitted within eight months and the full investigation concluded in about a year. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, we're slipping to a short break now, but still to come, US President Barack Obama stresses the need for tolerance, says cases of religious intolerance in India would have shocked Mahatma Gandhi. Details on the other side. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. कागज पर उतरी रेखाएं, नेता के माथे चिंताएं, ब्यूरो कैसी तनी तनी सी, पब्लिक लेकिन खिली खिली सी, लेता है सबकी वो खबर, धारदार है इसकी नजर, नहीं बोलता ये किरदार, लेकिन सब हैं खबरदार, पढ़ने वाले का जीते मन, सिर्फ एक है वही लक्ष्मण, देखिए विरासत में इस बार आर के लक्ष्मण का कार्टून संसार about television. Well, just days after his India visit, U.S. President Barack Obama has again taken up the topic of religious intolerance in India. The U.S. President said religious intolerance in India would have shocked Mahatma Gandhi. Obama was speaking at an annual breakfast prayer meet in Washington, D.C. Here's a report. A day after the White House refuted suggestions that the U.S. President's public speech in New Delhi in which he touched upon religious tolerance was a potting shot aimed at the ruling BJP, 
Barack Obama had this to say at a prayer meet in Washington, D.C. He said, and I quote, Michelle and I returned from India, an incredible, beautiful country full of magnificent diversity, but a place where in the past years, religious faiths of all types have on occasion been targeted by other peoples of faith simply due to their heritage and their beliefs, acts of intolerance that would have shocked Gandhiji. In the wide-ranging speech, Obama also touched upon the terror unleashed by the Islamic State. We have seen violence and terror perpetrated by those who profess to stand up for faith, their faith. Profess to stand up for Islam, but in fact are betraying it. We see ISIS, a brutal, vicious death cult that, in the name of religion, carries out unspeakable acts of barbarism terrorizing religious minorities like the Yazidis, subjecting women to rape as a weapon of war, and claiming the mantle of religious authority for such actions. This prayer meet was also keenly watched by the Chinese, as it had the Dalai Lama in attendance, but Obama did not meet the Tibetan spiritual leader in exile. Though Obama did refer to the Dalai Lama as his good friend and acknowledged his presence in the audience. A good friend, uh, His Holiness, uh, the Dalai Lama. Bureau Report, Rajasabha TV. Meanwhile, U.S. President Barack Obama's budget proposal for 2016 called for increased uh, spending and uh, lay out a number of new tax rises to enable funding. It also forecasted uh, continued fiscal deficits over the next decade. But implementing the proposals needed clearance from the Congress, which is dominated by the opposition Republican Party. The party has already dismissed, dismissed the proposal and has said it will come out with a proposal of its own. Here's a report. A $4 trillion budget for the United States fiscal year 2016 with programs to prop up the middle class and taxing the wealthy. He speaks of doing away with austerity measures that cap domestic and defence spending. President Barack Obama's budget details $3.99 trillion in spending and collects $3.52 trillion in revenue, running a deficit of $474 billion. The budget outlines significant tax hikes, primarily on the wealthy and firms. The $238 billion raised would be used to fund infrastructure projects across the country. The budget achieves some $1.8 trillion in deficit reduction over the next 10 years through health care, tax and immigration reforms. But how much of this can actually see the light of day? Without the buffer of a Democrat-controlled Senate, it is unlikely that the proposals will be cleared at all, which makes the exercise more targeted for the 2016 presidential campaign than creation of a realistic fiscal roadmap. Rhetorically, at least, we hear the White House echo Republican calls for policies aimed at helping the middle class. But then we see the White House push more of the same stale, top-down policies favored by political bosses over on the left. Funding for homeland security remains a boiling issue raked up in the budget. Obama said the Republicans would be putting the entire nation at risk if they did not fully fund the department. This comes in the backdrop of Republicans planning to curtail the department's funding to block Obama's executive orders on immigration. A large majority uh, or a large percentage of Republicans agreed that we needed comprehensive immigration reform and were prepared to act uh, in the Senate and should have acted in the House. But if they don't agree with me, that's fine. That's how our democracy works. Uh, you may have noticed they usually don't agree with me. <laughs> but don't jeopardize our national security over this disagreement. And if Republicans let Homeland Security funding expire, it's the end to any new initiatives in the event that a new threat emerges. It's the end of grants to states and cities that improve local law enforcement and keep our communities safe. Obama does have some pressure points to force Republicans to the negotiating table. Republicans want to free the military of automatic spending caps, something Obama will not accept without relief for domestic programs as well. Republicans are expected to put forward their own proposals in a few weeks' time. Obama's plan is just the opening gambit in lengthy negotiations expected with the Congress. Bureau Report, Raj Sabha TV. Well, much else has been unfolding around the world. Here's a quick wrap of the other international news of the week.
Boko Haram insurgents killed scores of people on the Nigeria-Cameroon border on Wednesday, slitting throats and shooting victims. The attackers allegedly moved from door to door slaughtering people in the pre-dawn raid in the town of Fotokol. The militants opened fire on at least three mosques, including the central mosque, as worshippers were offering their morning prayers. They burned the central mosque after killing worshippers, including the imam. A court in Egypt has sentenced 230 people to life in prison for their role in the protests that toppled former President Hosni Mubarak in 2011. Among the defendants was the prominent liberal activist Ahmed Douma, already in prison for a violation of Egypt's new public order law. Douma was also fined 2.2 million US dollars for setting fire to a science academy housing rare manuscripts. Last week, Egypt had sent 183 people to the gallows in the case. The World Health Organization said on Wednesday that the number of new cases of Ebola went up in all three of West Africa's worst-hit countries in the last week of January. It is the first weekly increase in 2015, ending a series of encouraging declines. The WHO says Sierra Leone registered 80 of the 124 new cases, Guinea 39 and Liberia the remaining five. Almost 9,000 people have died from Ebola since December 2013. The European Central Bank, or the ECB, has toughened its stance with Greece by restricting financing to the country's banks. In a statement, the central bank said it would no longer accept Greek government bonds as collateral for lending money to commercial banks. The move makes access to cash more expensive for Greece's banks. The ECB said the suspension came as it could not assume a successful deal on Greece's 240 billion euros bailout. Al Jazeera journalist Peter Greste has returned to Brisbane, Australia to be reunited with his family following his release from an Egyptian prison. After being released, he described his relief and praised the long campaign to free him and his colleagues. Greste and two colleagues were arrested in 2013. They were convicted of spreading false news and aiding the banned Muslim Brotherhood. The jailing of the journalist sparked an international outcry. Shifting focus now, it's time to bring you up to speed with all the sports news that you might have missed this week. Here's our sports wrap. The New England Patriots overcame the deflate gate row to beat the Seattle Seahawks 28-24 in the Super Bowl. The Patriots are being investigated over allegations they underinflated balls in beating the Indianapolis Colts to reach the showpiece event. But despite trailing 24-14, they rallied to become the first team in Super Bowl history to trail by double digits in the second half and win. The Patriots took the lead with two minutes left and held on for victory. Liverpool staged a stirring late comeback to strike twice in the closing minutes to beat Bolton Wanderers just as the championship side threatened the latest FA Cup shock. Ido Gudjonsson's contentious penalty just before the hour gave Bolton a lead that they clanged on to almost till the end. Raheem Sterling finally broke Bolton's resistance with a cool finish in the 86th minute before Philippe Coutinho curled a magnificent winner in extra time to give Liverpool a fifth round tie at Crystal Palace. Australian captain Michael Clarke's long-time personal trainer has claimed that the skipper is giving everything he possibly can to meet the fitness deadline to clinch his spot in the World Cup squad. Duncan Kerr, who first worked with Clarke 17 years ago, claimed that he is unaware of the specifics of the test Clarke must pass by February 21st, saying that it's all pretty much hush-hush at the moment. However, reports have hinted that the requirements set by Cricket Australia are unnecessarily harsh. Kerr, meanwhile, is not bothered by that and said that they would see how it goes later. Kimi Raikkonen completed a successful first pre-season test for Ferrari by setting the pace on the final day at Spain's Jerez track. It was the third time in four days a Ferrari was fastest as the teams reached one-third distance in their preparations for the 2015 season. Sauber's Marcus Ericsson was second ahead of Lewis Hamilton, whose Mercedes team completed by far the most mileage. McLaren had another tough day, still struggling with their new Honda engine. Jensen Button did only 35 laps and was 6.8 seconds off the pace.
Moving on, now here's a look at what's creating a buzz in the world of show business. Here's our entertainment roundup. The Queen of Pop will get her chance to rule at the Brit Awards again. Madonna will return to her old stomping ground later this month when she performs at the British Recording Industries flagship awards ceremony. The veteran singer confirmed rumours that she'd be at the ceremony on Twitter. The 2015 gala will be held on February 25th at the O2 Arena in London. Madonna won Brits in 2001 and 2006 in the Best International Female category. It's been a full 20 years since she last performed at the awards ceremony. Pulitzer Prize winning author Harper Lee would publish her second novel more than 50 years after the release of her classic To Kill a Mockingbird. Go Set a Watchman, which was written in the 1950s and features characters from the earlier novel, is scheduled to be published on July 14 by Harper Publishers. To Kill a Mockingbird, which won the Pulitzer Prize, was adapted into a 1962 film and has sold more than 40 million copies globally since it was published in 1960. Entertainment giant Walt Disney has credited the continuing success of toys based on its hit film Frozen and an increase in visitors to its theme parks for an incredibly strong quarter. Net income rose 19% to $2.2 billion in the quarter with revenues up 9% to $13.4 billion, both better than forecast. Frozen toys sold particularly well, helping its consumer products division to report a 22% rise in sales. The company also reported a 9% rise in sales at its theme parks and resorts for the three months to the end of December. Felicity Jones is set to play the female lead in the upcoming Star Wars standalone film. Lucasfilms and Disney have brought in the 31-year-old Oscar-nominated actress for the project, which will be helmed by Gareth Edwards from a script by Chris Weitz. The news follows the secret meeting, reading and testing that were going on for the role last week in Los Angeles, which also had actresses Tatiana Maslany and Rooney Mara among others involved. And finally, well, Katy Perry delivered a spectacular halftime show at the Super Bowl assisted by special guests Missy Elliott and Lenny Kravitz. Perry entered the field astride a giant golden robotic lion as she sang her hit Roar before Kravitz brought some rock guitar to a version of I Kissed a Girl. I'm going to leave you this week with visuals from the Super Bowl halftime show. Enjoy. <laughs>